Hello everyone. This is Miriam Naime from Newcastle University and the Alan Turing Institute. Welcome to our SuperGen Smart Charging Webinar. The webinar is an activity uh, of the Vehicle Grid Integration Group at the Alan Turing Institute. The Alan Turing is the National Institute in the UK for Data Science and AI. One of the objectives of the Institute is to apply data science to help solve real world problems, such as what we are doing in the Vehicle Grid Integration Group, where we want to help support the decarbonization of transport and electricity infrastructure. We've had talks already on national and uh, regional plans for the rollout of electric vehicles. We also had talks on uh, communication protocols for electric vehicles, and the recent series is on cybersecurity. The slides uh, on our landing page and the videos on our YouTube playlist. Some of the uh, talking points uh, that were part of the communication protocol series were summarized in a paper that we recently published uh, in Energy Informatics. This paper was in collaboration with a colleague uh, in Denmark at DTU. What we see here in this graph is that several players are involved in smart charging. We can see in the below of the graph, the electric vehicle supply equipment or the charger can be controlled directly by a third party operator, whether that be an energy supplier or an aggregator or a combination of both, or it could be controlled through an energy management system at home or at the building. Now with so many players involved and so many uh, data points involved, it is important that these players are speaking uh, are understanding each other, are speaking one language, so that we avoid infrastructure where a subset of players are speaking their own language with a subset of the infrastructure. And one thing we highlight is the importance to converge towards very few communication protocols. Now, because there's extensive data flow, there's an other important point we talk about, and it's security. So we have pricing information, we have the state of the network information shared, we have control signals sent across the system, and we want those entities to trust the system. So we want people to trust that they will have a full battery when they need it. We will also want them to, to trust uh, that the pricing information is, uh, they are receiving is correct and that information is secure. We also want the network operators to trust that a hacker is not easily able to charge or discharge the cars to uh, uh, impact the network. So part of the series, uh, in collaboration with the International Energy Agency Task Force 3 on vehicle grid integration, is looking at the security and privacy. So what are the challenges? What are some of the solutions that we need to deploy? And today's talk is on the UK cyber policy for energy smart appliances, including some of the standardization work uh, that is uh, going on. Uh, we have James Morgan, who's head of smart energy cybersecurity at uh, the Department for Energy Industry uh, and uh, Innovation Strategy, and Nina Klein, who's a member of the Technical Energy Spe Specialist Team. So without further ado, I'd like to um, give the presentation to James, then followed by Nina, and we'll take the questions at the end. Brilliant. Well, thanks a lot, Miriam. Uh, James Morgan here, folks. I'm just going to share my screen, so bear with me a second. And I'll get going. So thanks for that introduction. As I said, Miriam, my name is James Morgan, um, Head of Smart Energy Cybersecurity in the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Uh, that's the last time I'll be spelling that out. I'll be saying Bayes from now on. Um, worth uh, just highlighting as well that uh, this role is a it's a brand new role in the smart energy team in Bayes. Um, certainly kind of a recognition of how cybersecurity considerations are gaining more and more traction in the context of smart energy policy. 
Uh, I'm sure those on the webinar listening in have seen these conversations grow more and more in your various areas as well. Um, really pleased to be part of this uh, webinar, by the way. I've kind of logged into a couple of them in the past. I think they're excellent. I hope that we can deliver to the, the kind of high standard that I've seen so far. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, do, going to describe why government cares about smart energy. I'm sure you've all heard this before, but it's always good to go through it. Um, I'm going to describe the journey in terms of the policy context of smart energy cybersecurity that we've been through in the past few years um, and explain just how we got to where we are today. And then I'm going to hand over to Nina, who's going to describe a really kind of key piece of work um, that, that we're all kind of inputting on uh, developing standards for energy smart appliances uh, with the British Standards Institute. Um, so if we do get this right, there's going to be a seamless transition from me providing really high level government policy chat into discussing finer points of interoperable S1 interfaces. So we'll see how that goes. So as I promised, a brief recap on why all this matters to UK government and to the UK in general. It is not a surprise to anyone, I'm sure, but the energy system is rapidly changing, lower carbon, more decentralized, and interestingly, more and more consumers are participating and becoming more interested and involved in their energy use, um, with more and more electric vehicles coming on to the scene, a new source of flexible demand alongside the existing um, uh, solar power and batteries, enabling consumers to sell excess energy back to the grid. So the emerging system is, uh, yeah, quite an exciting one. Um, of course, smart, these smart systems and flexibility technologies are core components of the evolving system. They enable us to do a lot of things, decreasing reliance on traditional generation, increasing deployment of low carbon generation, um, increase and be more efficient with our integration of energy produced by renewable means um, and bringing that efficiency kind of out to the whole system as well and making those uh, operational sort of decisions in the whole system level more efficient. From a network company's perspective, um, obviously de deferring or avoiding those large network uh, investments um, is a positive aspect. Of course, there is also a monetary value associated with this. Government analysis has indicated that moving to a smart, flexible energy system could reduce costs by up to £40 billion by 2050. So I mentioned that obviously the energy system itself is is rapidly changing and that sort of speed of transition is also partly due to another key government policy driver and that's the decarbonisation of transport. So again I'm sure you're all very aware transport became the largest emitting sector of greenhouse gas emissions in 2016 and by 2018 domestic UK greenhouse gas emissions were at 28% uh, from transport um, so clearly, uh, government has a strategy um, to uh, decarbonise the transport sector in the UK. And with that strategy is the Road to Zero, published in July 2018, with that core mission of the UK looking to, the UK will end the sale of new conventional petrol and diesel cars and vans by 2040. I think it's also worth saying that 2019 was a pretty big year in terms of this journey towards um, a more decarbonised transport sector. We saw pure battery electric vehicle sales doubling in 2019 compared to 2018. Interestingly, I think anyway, I was in OLEV at this time, so it was quite fun to be um, part of the journey. Um, the pure battery electric sales outs were higher than the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle sales uh, in 2019 as well, not by much, but by a little bit. Um, so more and more zero emission miles potentially being driven. And just a few months ago, admittedly before the global pandemic had a big impact on the market, um, 
SMMT were highlighting that though uh, the kind of overall market share remains low, I mean, it's still pretty high given the journey we've been on, but the overall market share remained, remained low in March. More 30, 34 new models of electric vehicles were looking, were possibly going to come out in 2020. So electric vehicle manufacturers reacting as well. Um, with yeah, with 65 already on sale, you can see that's a big increase in 2019. And of course, all of this is actually old news right now, right? Because um, at the moment, government has is consulting, so that consultation is still open. But Olev are consulting on um, or, uh, on bringing forward the end to the sale of new petrol, diesel, and hybrid and hybrid cars and vans. So the and hybrid is an interesting change to flag. Uh, but bringing forward the end to that end of the sale uh, from 2040 to 2035 or even earlier if a faster transition appears feasible. So I think the key point is that it, there is no, unlikely to be kind of any let up on government side in terms of decarbonizing transport, which likely means there's going to be more and more electric vehicles on the system and we're accelerating towards that smart and flexible energy system even quicker. So what does all this mean? Well, Miriam's already touched on it, but clearly more and more IoT devices, more and more appliances capable of demand side response in domestic and non-domestic contexts. So obviously this is a smart charging webinar, so EVs and EV charge points are sort of front and center, but it's worth mentioning, obviously there are lots and lots of appliances that could be capable of demand side response in future and using a number of different existing networks. Again, as Miriam already mentioned, I've put, it, I've put this down as more aggregators. Uh, Miriam referred to them as um, kind of third party entities. You could also describe them as Nina will later, I'm sure, as demand side response service providers, but more new actors in the space um, that I'm going to bluntly call aggregation at this point. And so this could be far, like completely new actors in terms of what we traditionally seen um, with uh, different sectors ent entering the space and being capable of controlling large amounts of load. And of course, in order to make all of this actually work, you're gonna need many, many more connections, uh, more existing networks. And as a result, clearly cybersecurity becomes kind of a core priority. Um, both for consumers in terms of protecting their data, but, and, but also from an energy sp system perspective. So the energy system is a core facet of uh, the UK's critical national infrastructure. So anything that risks, um, anything that could bring risks to the smooth running of the system would be seen as a government priority. Um, and I think also, I haven't got it on this slide, but I do think it kind of, that transition towards demand side response does require a bit of a shift in consumer confidence. Um, it will be kind of a bit of a new world for a lot of consumers. And so a kind of a robust cybersecurity strategy is uh, pretty kind of critical to ensure that, that consumer confidence can be kind of grown and maintained. So I'm gonna spend a bit of time describing, I guess the journey from where we were a few years ago in terms of smart energy cybersecurity policy uh, and show kind of how the thinking has progressed uh, in terms of the strategic documents that government has published. So in November 2016, we teamed up with Ofgem to publish the call for evidence relating to a smart flexible energy system, all about asking industry about kind of the problems, the challenges um, that the industry was facing in getting projects off the ground uh, and kind of challenge asking industry to challenge us to say well what can government and Ofgem do about it to remove those sort of regulatory and policy barriers to achieving a smarter and more flexible energy system. Um, the responses we got I think kind of recognize how early in the journey it was. Um, obviously as you can imagine the majority of respondents agreed with the view that there could be potential cybersecurity risks, sure, there could be risk to system stability. Um, but 
but of course it was such it was of course such early days that um it was kind of too early to think that this was potentially uh, i don't know like a huge problem it's hard to know um and so what industry obviously really didn't want was and don't want in general um is for government to kind of step in with an overly prescriptive regulatory response and they want any regulatory response beyond cyber security as well to be proportionate to the risks identified um and so yeah that is the classic balance i suppose um for government in all of this now if you're obviously if you're wanting the regulatory response to be proportionate to the risks then it's pretty important that you work out what the scale of that risk is. So many suggested there should be work, more work to work that out. So we got over 200 responses to that call for evidence and using those, we developed the smart systems and flexibility plan alongside Offsherm and that was published in 2017. Uh, and uh, with an update, sorry, in 20, with an update, sorry, in 2018. So there were 29 actions in the original document and then we added nine new actions in the update in 2018. There are a few in there that um, relate, I think, to cybersecurity policy. Uh, I just picked out three. There are a few others as well, but I think these are the most sort of prominent to mention here. Uh, Action 2.6, government committing to consult on taking powers to set regulatory requirements for smart appliances. Um, then 2.7, government sort of taking advantage of the work uh, on the DFT side about driving through the automated and electric vehicle bill um, to regulate smart charging infrastructure for electric for electric vehicles. So a little bit of a kind of a step ahead of Action 2.6 already due to the existence of that bill. Um, and as mentioned previously, you've got to work out, well, what is the risk going to be? Uh, or what is the risk now and what is the risk going to be in future? And so Action 2.10, uh, government committing to commissioning work to assess the magnitude of that risk. And following on from that, what actually happened? Well, a little step further, um, government did consult and has now committed to taking powers um, for setting regulatory requirements for smart appliances, very dependent on parliamentary time. Um, but that's committed. Now, of course, if you want to set regulatory requirements, how are you going to describe the detail? Well, Bayes commissioned BSI, the British Standards Institute, to develop a set of technical standards for energy smart appliances to really um, kind of provide that detail. And Nina will be describing that um, after myself. I mentioned the automated electric vehicle bill. It became an act. And in what I can't really believe it was only a year ago, but in July or almost a year ago, in July 2019, Olev consulted on proposals for regulations mandating that all private electric vehicle charge points sold or installed in the UK are smart. Um, I just sort of wanted to spend a bit of time talking about that quickly, just to say, I think that that was quite a kind of key document in progressing, um, progressing the cybersecurity thinking for certainly for policymakers and um, industry to an extent as well. Um, it kind of highlighted the challenge that, okay, these regulations were all around ensuring that the electric vehicle charge points can be smart and that they're secure and they meet uh, requirements mandating that they are secure. But what about the entities that can control large numbers of charge points? What about those third party entities that we've mentioned previously? Uh, and beyond that, what about the rest of the system as well? How do we, we don't want to be uh, creating cybersecurity policy in isolation and not thinking about the entire system. It's obviously very important. And, I, and the call for evidence on the long term aspects of smart charging explored that um, and important to mention as well that I think I, can't, I think it was last week. Yeah, it was last last week. Um, Olaf did publish uh, a summary of responses to that consultation. So plenty of information there about how industry felt on our proposals. Um, just worth mentioning as well that uh, Bayes did commission a study on uh, identifying and mitigating cybersecurity risks in a smart energy system and that's become a core piece of work and further work is uh, ongoing to understand the risks.
So I've spent a bit of time describing, I guess, what, I, what I'd say is the journey, but just within kind of the barriers or the parameters of the smart energy perspective. But I wanted to highlight how we are cognizant of the fact there's loads going on elsewhere, both in Bayes and in other aspects of um, UK government. Um, within, Bayes, within Bayes, there are teams looking at those, the um, the cybersecurity protections associated with the large scale aggregation that's already taking place at industrial and commercial levels. Um, and again, really thinking about that holistic system approach and from our perspective, lessons learned from that aspect. Uh, and kind of noting that, I guess, the borders between what is industrial and commercial and domestic could become more blurred as the transition uh, progresses, certainly with regards to electric vehicles and other things like that. Um, the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport um, are obviously um, putting a lot of work on cybersecurity uh, through their Secure by Design work um, and clearly some crossover work with their strengthening of um, the security of consumer IoT devices um, and some, yeah, so some crossover work with that with our work on smart appliances and charge points in general. So we're staying kind of joined up with them. Um, the National Center for Cybersecurity, or National Cybersecurity Center, I should say, um, that government arm of cybersecurity technical expertise. We work really closely with them with all of these questions, um, making use of the kind of the expertise that they have on the technical side and the frameworks that they've already provided for cybersecurity. I haven't mentioned it on this slide, but we work closely. Uh, within Bayes with the smart metering implementation program teams as well. Obviously with the smart meter program, they've played this game before to some extent with regards to cyber security of an overall system. And there's a lot of lessons to learn from their work. Um, just mentioning, I've already mentioned the work on understanding energy system cybersecurity risk. And I just wanted to highlight um, a bit, a bit more about the smart systems and flexibility plan. And just to say, we're thinking about kind of what comes next. We know that that smart systems and flexibility plan and the subsequent update represented first steps, I suppose, in the transition. Uh, we're doing a lot of thinking about what comes next and stakeholder engagement is a really, really big part of this. Um, we're in the midst right now of several kind of online workshop webinars as such. Uh, they're interactive, people on the call may have been involved in them already. Um, and uh, I want to highlight that the that we have a workshop coming up on uh, aggregators specifically that I'll be involved in alongside my colleagues. Um, and hot off the press, I should say that we have almost, I'm pretty sure we've landed on a date. I'm going to give it a 99% chance. Um, but that is looking like it's going to be on the 15th of June. Um, so we will be sending out invites pretty soon to that, but if you are, if this is the first you've heard of it, or if in any case, if you're interested in um, attending that and inputting, we'd be really pleased to have you. We want as much industry expertise on that um, workshop as possible. Do please email smartenergy, or one word, at bays.gov.uk uh, if you'd like to come along. Um, I've also just put at the bottom there many other things. Um, I just want to highlight that I don't think I know all the answers. I don't know everything that's going on in terms of um, cybersecurity policy in the UK, but I'm trying to learn as much as I can. But also, obviously, there's a lot going on internationally as well. And I think that sort of takes me on to what is my final slide, assuming I can get it to work. Which is, how do we bring it all together? So obviously in order to ensure that the, so this is just a high level diagram of the, of the energy system, but, and it's obviously very, very important that cybersecurity policy can be seen from a holistic perspective. You need to ensure as the phrase that uh, I'm sure you've all heard a thousand times before, security is a chain that's only as strong as its weakest link. Um, and I think ultimately the policy approach kind of needs to follow suit, right? Um, I've described a lot of things going on um, in various different parts of government and beyond, 
but I guess the challenge for me and the challenge for my team is to work out, well, are they, is everything as connected as it needs to be? Um, and that kind of big question is, I guess what I will sort of leave you with, I guess, is the big question for me and my team is how do we bring together the, the various strands of work going on to produce that sort of coherent, proportionate and dynamic cybersecurity policy strategy for the emerging smart energy system? Uh, it's a pretty big challenge, but uh, I'm definitely excited to be part of it. Um, that's all from me, everyone. Uh, there's that email I mentioned, just to plug that uh, aggregation workshop. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now and I'll invite Nina to uh, talk a little bit about the BSI standards. Okay, thanks James. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yeah. Um, great. Um, so yeah, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'll just echo James and say that this has been a really great webinar series and I hope we can do it justice. So um, following on from James's presentation then, that wider kind of policy background, I'll give a deep dive into one of the key projects that is a government priority. So I'll kind of introduce to you today the cybersecurity of energy smart appliances for demand side response. And this is a programme of standards development work with the British Standards Institution. And um, so I'm Nina and I'm an energy engineer at Bayes uh, working alongside James. So to start off then, I'll kind of give the context, particularly for this smart standards work. Um, slides are still okay, you can all see them. Yeah, great. Um, so standardisation uh, can be a really helpful tool to help lower the costs uh, and promote innovation in these technologies while kind of accelerating the uptake of devices that are secure and interoperable and as James has said that's kind of, um, priority for government. So I think it's also important as James kind of highlighted that these technical specifications can be useful underpinning details for um, future regulations and as James has said in the UK uh, the Automated and Electric Vehicles Act does give uh, powers to require um, technical technical capabilities of smart charge points. Um, and I think another key point here is that the UK does have a really good uh, leadership position on these smart technologies and services. And so when these standards are published, they can be promoted to international standards bodies um, for adoption and that can kind of help um, solidify the UK leadership in this area. So in terms of the approach we're taking to these standards then and the scope, um, the standards covers five different types of appliances. So HVAC appliances, cold and wet appliances, controversially dryers are also covered, despite being neither cold nor wet, um, but it's the exception that proves the rule. Uh, they also cover battery storage. And of course, for you guys, most importantly, they cover EV smart charge points, not the EV cars themselves, but the smart charge points. Um, and so as you can see, these are all domestic appliances. And so this would cover home electric vehicle charge points although it, parts of it may be applicable to private and public sector charge points. It's not explicitly in the scope of these passes. Um, and these standards are underpinned by four key policy principles, um, and I'll just run you through them. So the first one is interoperability, and this is the ability of a smart appliance to work seamlessly across any DSR service operated by any system player. The second one is data privacy, and that's about securely storing data on the device or with any controlling party. The third one is grid stability, and that's about preventing outages on the grid caused by sort of unintended operation of smart appliances. And the fourth one, again, very important to you guys is cybersecurity, so the prevention of unauthorized access to devices by third parties. So those are kind of broad principles uh, underpinning these standards. And then finally, just a note on compatibility. These standards are compatible uh, with the GB smart metering system, but they don't mandate the use of that system because they have that international nature and scope. So in terms of the process then, these standards are being led by the British Standards Institution and what they're developing there is a standardised technical framework which covers both energy smart appliances and demand side response in kind of two separate PASs. So PAS 1878 uh, covers the energy smart appliances PAS 1879 covers the kind of wider demand side response framework. So by integrating both of them, you kind of get an end-to-end -end framework to operate domestic demand side response. 
And these are being developed by BSI in an industry led process with um, expert steering groups inputting. And a couple of our steering group members are on the call today, so I, I'll do a shout out thank you to them for their really invaluable input to this process. We've been engaging with industry from an, a really wide range of sectors, so over 40 organisations with nine trade associations on those steering groups and advisory groups. Um, and also we'll have an um, invited review panel for these standards, which at the moment has 120 at least people. And I'm hoping after today there'll be even more because I'll have piqued your interest. Um, so, as I said, these are PAS standards. That's a publicly available specification. It's basically a form of fast track standard. So a technical author drafts the standard. Those expert steering groups then review the standard and provide comments. And then in summer 2020, we'll be having that public review. So again, we're looking for people to be on that invited panel. And I think you guys all have relevant expertise. So we'd really welcome you getting in touch. Um, and then after that public review and all those comments have been taken into account, we're hoping to publish them in early 2021. Um, but it's important to note as well that these passes are updated every two years because obviously this is a very fast moving marketplace. So in terms of the technical approach then, I think the, the one thing to really remember is that these standards are only specifying the minimum requirements to meet those four policy principles of interoperability, data privacy, grid stability and cybersecurity. And by specifying only the minimum is really important because it allow, allows there to be innovation on top of that minimum. And so this framework focuses mainly on called sort of called demand side response services, but it does have kind of integration and handles for other services to be built on top by these innovators. So the standard um, is quite clearly focused on, you know, demand response for um, peak shaving for local constraints or frequency response services. It doesn't necessarily specify how you would, you know, optimize the energy utilization of a whole house, although there are points for integration of that. Because we feel that in that kind of area, you know, leave that up to the IP of private companies to develop and innovate in that area where there's so much going on. From a commercial point of view, then, it was very important to construct the framework that enables revenue. So making sure there can be fast response times from a technical point of view to allow high value DSR services to be provided. And also really important to not restrict business models, as this is clearly uh, an evolving marketplace. And then finally, as I said, um, a key technical priority was for these standards to align with international standards where that's possible. Um, although some of these are still currently under development, so we're integrating uh, very sensitively with them and working in tandem. And I like to put the uh, logos for the international committees on my slides because it just fills me with confidence that they've all chosen to use the same standardised blue just a good sign, isn't it? So, okay, now is the time to get technical. Uh, so either you can wake up or go to sleep, depending on how your afternoon is going. Um, I'll kind of have two parts to the technical bit. This first part is that kind of framework of energy smart appliances and demand side response. And then the second part will focus on cybersecurity. And just to note that these are draft proposals. The PASs are currently under development um, with those industry steering groups. So first things first is definitions. And by that, of course, I basically mean acronyms. So brace yourselves. Uh, the first acronym is DSRSP. So that's a demand side response service provider. Now, essentially, that's just an organization that provides demand side energy management services. So that might be a charge point operator or it might be an aggregator. We're just using that generic term DSRSP to cover all of these new entities who are emerging. The second acronym is SEM, that's a consumer energy manager. So this is just a logical entity. That means it can be physical in a house or virtual in the cloud. And it basically just deals with flexibility information. Essentially, it's kind of a translation point between that DSRSP and the smart appliance. So it sits kind of in the middle there, you can see. And then finally, the ESA, that's the energy smart appliance. And we're defining that as an internet connected device that can modulate or shift its electricity consumption in response to signals. And so for you, that would be the EV smart charge point. So this is our system architecture. And I've got to say it looks complicated, but that's because it is. Um, I think the key thing to take away is that there are multiple routes but they all should achieve that same minimum standard for those principles, interoperability, data privacy, grid security, cyber 
cybersecurity. So multiple routes, same minimum standards. In terms of demand side response services, then there are kind of two key types. So the first one is kind of on the far right hand side of this diagram, and that's kind of real time markets, um, which is often played in by energy suppliers or utilities. And uh, that's what we would describe as routine mode demand side response, routine mode DSR, where maybe an appliance is being run on something like a time of use tariff in order to provide DSR. The second kind of type of DSR is this middle one with the system operator. So here, this is more about bilateral advanced contracts, where maybe a DSR SP is being contracted to provide a response mode DSR service, like a DSR call, like frequency response. Um, so they're the kind of two key types of DSR. Now, this structure is compatible with the existing international standards in this space. And so there are a couple of key interfaces I'll draw your attention to. The first one is S1. So if you can see that's between the DSR SP and the SEM. Now this interface is interoperable. So it must be specified so that a SEM can communicate to any DSR SP. Now the second interface is S2. This interface is being left in the current BSI standards as proprietary. So the SEM communicating down to the ESA can be a proprietary interface. So for example, that could still be OCPP for the EV charge points, but then above for that S1 interface needs to be specified to be interoperable. Um, and so I think the kind of key points that fall out of this architectural model is that to achieve the principles, at a minimum, a smart appliance must be supplied with a SEM. Now, that doesn't mean a third party to the appliance manufacturer can't provide the SEM for the appliance, but to achieve interoperability, the appliance has to have that SEM so that it can speak to any DSR service provider. And I think another important point that kind of falls out of this architecture is that a user or a customer can subscribe an individual energy smart appliance to any DSR service. And what that means is you can have multiple DSR SPs per house. And we think this is useful because it's likely that DSR SPs are going to kind of specialize in particular types of ESA. So if you're very, very good at controlling electric vehicle charge points, that's probably a slightly different skill set to be very good at controlling HVAC equipment. And so this architecture allows multiple DSR SPs to specialize in particular types of uh, appliances or particular types of grid services. So then how exactly does this system operate? Based on that architecture, we've kind of defined a hierarchy of DSR operation. And there's those two key modes that I mentioned. So that first mode, routine mode, which is the right hand side of that diagram with the energy supplier. And then there's that response mode, which was that kind of middle of the diagram, DSRSP doing called response. And the way the hierarchy works is that routine mode is basically that baseline operation for DSR. So here, electricity consumption is being controlled according to the consumer's wishes, wishes and any external stimuli. So if the consumer wished to run for lowest cost, then it would be running on a time of use tariff. And that would come in on that right hand side route via the energy supplier. Now, the second mode is response mode. And this mode overrides that baseline during a DSR call period. And that all will happen unless the consumer does an additional manual intervention. The consumer's preferences are already built in, but they always have the opportunity to override, so their wishes are always being respected. So if response mode is triggered, then what that means is that the electricity consumption will still be operating according to the consumer's wishes, but it will be changed in order to operate with the DSRSP's chosen flexibility option. So that might be saying, hold on, don't do your time of use tariff for a moment, as a frequency response call, the DSRSP asks for frequency response mode to be activated for a specific period. And then after that, it can go back to that baseline operation. So that's the hierarchy um, for the system. So the way it kind of works in practice is that the SEM will create these flexibility options based on the consumer's preferences and you know how the appliance works and that kind of thing. And basically those preferences will allow the SEM to define a kind of baseline operation baseline flexibility option for that routine mode. That's what would normally happen, baseline operation. And then also kind of maximum and minimum flexibility options that can be useful for that response mode. And whenever the flexibility options change because the consumers decided they'd like to um, have their car charging finished a little bit earlier than they had thought, 
then those flexibility options have obviously altered, that maximum will have changed. And so the DSRSP gets an update of what the new flexibility is. So it's always got kind of a live merit order, knowing what flexibility is available to it. So then during a DSR call, um, the DSRSP can request flexibility, maybe that maximum option or that minimum flexibility option. Um, and they'll be doing that from hundreds of thousands of devices. And so these requests will be statistically calculated and will include some kind of overhead because, you know, a couple hundred, a couple thousand of the devices are probably expected not to respond. And that kind of makes the system uh, quite resilient, the fact that it's kind of statistical in nature. So I think we've got time uh, just to run through a little worked example then. And this is just one route, but it's just kind of illustrative to show how uh, you might use an internet connected SEM to deliver response mode. So you would start off in that baseline routine mode. The SEM is regularly creating those flexibility options and then like number one, sending those flexibility options up to the DSRSP. Now, whenever the status of that flexibility changes, again, just pushes an update up to the DSRSP. So then if the system operator asks for a DSR call, then the DSRSP would select which flexibility option is most suitable and how long they want it to last for. And then they'd send that chosen, maybe the maximum or minimum flexibility down to the SEM who would this then send it straight onto the ESA. Now, because the DSRSP has got all that flexibility pre-registered in real time and updated with a single request, it can achieve the ESA altering its energy consumption. And that means that really single request fast response means you can access those high value DSR services. So then you're operating in response mode. And here the SEM is regularly providing flexibility updates, number three, to the DSRSP, and also providing the active power of the ESA. And what that means, and that might need to be, you know, if it's a very fast responding DSR service, those updates might need to be very frequent, or if it's slower, they can be a little bit slower. But essentially, the reason why that's really important is because then the DSRSP can call more or less response from that live list uh, to make sure it's meeting those needs of the system operator. So then when that DSR call period ends, um, the ESA will go out of that response mode and it can go back into that routine mode, baseline operation, and, you know, maybe start running again on a time of use tariff, which it's got from its smart meter. So that's the kind of top to toe, how you do a little... Uh, run through of a demand side response call and have your appliance operating. So now, of course, uh, we have to save the best to a last and we'll get on to the cybersecurity elements. Um, and I'll just emphasize again that this is actively being drafted at the moment. So just draft proposals you'll see today. So in terms of the overall principles for cybersecurity, Really, the motivation of this is to protect the cybersecurity and data privacy of that communication system, the electricity network, the consumer. And I think one of the things that's really key to remember here is that these uh, ESAs are going to be aggregated and connected to the grid. So they're presenting as a CNI risk, you know, connection to the electricity grid and able to affect load and load in large volume. So because of that CNI risk, the security needs to go beyond just IoT security. This is IOE, the Internet of Energy. It's not just IoT, so it needs to have higher levels of security. But that said, the security requirements should be proportionate to the risks, while kind of respecting that there is always that compromise between cost, usability and security. And that's why this BSI process is so valuable, because it gathers these industry views on where that balance should sit. And again, a key principle, as, as before, is that these security requirements apply across all of those architectures and they have to achieve that same minimum level. So whether your SEM is in the cloud or in the home, whether you're sending your command by the smart metering network or by the public Internet, same minimum level of cybersecurity needs to be delivered. And, and just something kind of important to note is that sometimes it is necessary in the specification to say exactly how that security is implemented. And that's necessary in order for, to achieve that principle of interoperability. So it might seem overly prescriptive, but it is necessary because of that principle. So now I'll uh, give you a flavour of some of the approaches that are in that current draft. And basically all of it is to try and assure the trust and integrity of the framework. Um, and it's, you know, kind of common existing security techniques. So uh, apologies, there's no quantum cryptography here and it's all a little bit boring, but it's still important. 
So there's kind of three key uh, chunks here. So the first chunk is you want to have verified actors operating in this space. So that's the DSRSP. You need to have an appropriate authority to verify that that DSRSP is a legitimate actor. So to assure trust at that point of initialization. And then you can use a PKI system for messaging with digital certificates to maintain that trust. The kind of second chunk then is that you need to verify your assets now that you've verified your actors. So here at initialization, you know, there has to be firmware validation and various checks. And that's kind of to assure the integrity of the device at the startup. And then of course, during operation, you want to maintain that. So it's got to be secure updates and, and all that sort of thing. And then finally, the third chunk is to have secure communications. So between your ESA and your SEM and also between your SEM and your DSRSP. So messages will need to be secured by authentication and by encryption um, and connections, you know, can be established using secure initialization protocols using that PKI system. Um, but that's that kind of approach to get that top to bottom um, trust and integrity for the system. So a couple of notes uh, then that are interesting with that approach. Obviously, with the SEM uh, sitting, between that S1 interface and that S2 interface, which are going to be different, S1 being interoperable, S2 being proprietary, it might be necessary for the SEM to unencrypt, re-encrypt messages, modify them. So it's really important that the integrity of the SEM is secure. So software, firmware validation, updates, that kind of thing, very important. And then I think, again, reflecting those two different interfaces, because that S1 interface is interoperable, the security requirements there need to be prescriptive on how that security is implemented. So a PKI for the DSRSP, um, and we're looking at probably having profiled standards of existing international standards here. So the steering group are considering EEBUS and OpenADR for use of this S1 interface. And it's worth saying that OpenADR is, if implemented correctly, uh, compliant with NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. The S2 interface, uh, on the other hand, is proprietary. And so here, the specification only needs to require minimum principles be met or the uh, protocols are sort of equivalent to existing examples. So here, you know, OCPP uh, recommends TLS version 1.2. Steering group were discussing 1.3, but OCPP, you know, has a strong uh, security recommendation there. And so that could be suitable. Um, and then just a couple of uh, specifics in terms of the security of the IoT and the security of the organization. Um, for the kind of device itself, we receive, well, the, the specification will require best practice IoT security, including a recent Etsy standard on the cybersecurity for consumer IoT. Um, at the entity level, there's a little bit more discussion going on still, but maybe possibly referencing ISO 27000. Um, but given there are some smaller players in the market, um, that is very much still under consideration by the steering group, but just to kind of put a couple of examples out there um, to help explain that. So that's uh, all from me today. Um, if you do have any questions, get in touch and particularly um, get in touch if you would be interested to be on that invited reviewers panel during the public review period. Uh, we're hoping the PAS draft for 1878, that device level one, will be coming out towards the end of this month. So uh, don't delay, email today. Um, <laughs> we'd love to have you on that invited review panel. And do get in touch. Uh, this is the program for more information. Thanks. Thank you, Nina and James. There's a lot happening in the UK on, in the energy and EV uh, space. So thank you for sharing some of the uh, key happenings and also uh, how to get in touch if, if people are wanting to get involved. Uh, so, uh, if uh, the participants have questions, please do leave them in the chat box and I'll read them. Uh, to start with, um, maybe to start with uh, Nina uh, and, and on the PKI. So uh, we can leverage on PKI how it was used in other systems to secure communication uh, between entities, uh, but we need to set up the system. We need to have a certificate authority who's an entity issuing these digital certificates. On our first talk, we saw an overview of, of how this works, and on the second PKI webinar, we saw that there are different options of how we can set up this architecture. In the UK, are we at a stage where we know if this uh, CA is going to be a government organization or is it going to be 
uh, an industry or uh, where are we in, in, in the PPI space in the UK? Yeah, so that's a really, <laughs> a really good and really well relevant question. Um, I think the discussions around there are, are certainly not fully developed yet because they're probably more part of that second PAS, PAS 1879 at that kind of entity level framework. And so I think there'll be discussions there about, yeah, what kind of registration authority and root certificate authority you would want to have uh, assuring trust. Um, so we'll be gathering industry views on that and developing that thinking, um, which yeah, I don't think we've got firm answers yet, but that's definitely exactly the kind of questions that we'll be asking and, and getting that industry consensus on what, what will be appropriate. Okay, and what, what maybe this is both a question to you and James. What is the role of the National Center for Cybersecurity in all of this, specifically on the EP space? So the final um, bit again, specifically. Can you repeat the question, sorry, Marion? Uh, so what is the role of the National Center for Cybersecurity, maybe in the PK, PKI question on overall in the EV space? So I suppose um, really to kind of answer both sides, I wouldn't be able necessarily to answer in terms of those two specifics, but the National um, Center for Cybersecurity obviously provides um, that kind of government level cybersecurity expertise and um, yeah, technical expertise, um, which government um, can access in order to make decisions on this on this work. Um, and they've obviously got the um, previous experience from their work in helping to set up the smart metering infrastructure program and the system associated with that. Um, so we have a lot of faith that they are kind of um, a helpful body to be part of this question, really. Um, it's worth mentioning that there are quite a lot of different kind of government departments within Bayes and outside of Bayes, as I mentioned, um, involved. And in order to make kind of any uh, big decisions on any of this, and obviously the EV side brings that extra layer of interest from DFT as well, but in order to make any decisions on this, you sort of need that. You want kind of all of government to be in agreement with each other. So it is NCSCR, of course, a very important expert that we want. And we want their kind of agreement with the work that we're doing. Just as important as the other government departments, I would say. Thank you. Uh, we got a question on um, when talking about smart charging. Uh, Exactly mean is it eyes is it the communication protocols is it ISO 15118 OCPP 2.0.1 is it EBUS? From my perspective, when government is talking about smart charging, it's talking about the software, the hardware, and the communication protocol. Uh, what is your view on this? Yeah, it's um, interesting. That's the way that you cut it: software, hardware, communications protocols. Yeah. I know that. In the uh, smart charging consultation is maybe a little bit more around functions and services being provided. All these kind of principles, you know, if you're meeting these principles. Yeah, that was um, all I was going to mention, really. So certainly, I can't speak about the, the technical aspects, but from kind of a government perspective, um, I think we have a specific, if I remember correctly, there is a specific definition put forward in the um, electric vehicle smart charging consultation, although it is limited to um, kind of what is the definition of a smart charge point. And if I remember correctly, it's a charge point that's able to um, shift or modulate its uh, electricity usage in response to external signals or something similar to that. Beautiful so definition, that it, yes. Oh, <laughs> something similar to that. So, and, and it's about, it's really, it's about outcomes at this stage rather than, um, or certainly the proposals were putting, that were being put forward was about outcomes and not being too prescriptive in, in terms of a, a specific, for example, a specific communications protocol like the ones that have been um, listed on the chat. Um, and I suppose part of what, uh, uh, the BSI standards work, Nina will tell me if I'm wrong, but part of what the BSI standards work is kind of trying to do um, 
on EV charging and beyond really is to create a system that uh, where a lot of existing protocols are capable of tapping in to the standardization which uh, I don't think that we're in a position where we want to be sort of from a government perspective I would say we don't want to be picking winners as such we don't think uh, it's the right it's certainly it's certainly not the right sort of intervention uh, at this stage yeah, and I, I think all I'd add to what James has said is that, as I mentioned, the kind of focus of the scope of these particular PAL standards at this particular stage in their development cycle, with those two-year updates being borne in mind, um, is that focus on those called DSR responses and maybe leaving some of that other stuff, which some people might call smart, like whole house optimization, um, to, to be built on in future as those areas of industry are more developed and it's more appropriate for standardization to be there so it's a dynamic space and i'm sure our answer to that question will keep changing but we're at least kind of picking some of those low-hanging fruits to start with focusing on the communication protocols do you think we will go into a future where we see government picking certain communication protocols that have been used longer or they have more use cases or are you going to leave it to the market to decide which protocols to use Now that is a question. Yeah. Do you, do you want to go do something, Jeff? <laughs> I'll have a go. I'll have a go. Um, yeah. The easiest answer is uh, I don't know, but we're certainly we're certainly kind of to me. I don't think we're that close to that space yet. Um, there's kind of quite a lot of communication protocols out there with as, as people on the call on the webinar. Sorry, will know better than I with loads of various different ways that you can implement kind of the communication protocols. Uh, many that are kind of uh, many open protocols like the OC, like OCPP um, and ones that are less open, shall we say, the more proprietary protocols as well. I don't think um, at this stage, we're not in a position to select any one. And I, I don't really know when we will get to that, but we do have our specific principles that Nina has uh, mentioned uh, around uh, interoperability, cybersecurity, grid stability, and one that I've forgotten. I don't Data know privacy. Oh, I was doing so well. Um, the definition so, was great. Oh, nice. And so the um, and so look, we want any solution, for want of a better term, um, to be meeting those principles. Um, I don't think we want to go any further than that at this stage. Yeah, I think in the smart appliances consultation response, there's a bit more detail around that interoperability principle. And it does specifically say open protocols can be an enabler to interoperability. Um, and I think just with this BSI work, you know, we've taken this approach of industry led standards developments and we're gathering BSI, helping to facilitate and building an industry led consensus on which protocols can be most useful to the sector. And if you said the principles of what you want to be achieved and there is a protocol out there that's already doing this, then it's on uh, maybe the manufacturers to make sure they implement such a protocol to meet your requirements. In the future, will we see certification of chargers to ensure that they are meeting the security requirements uh, you are setting? Um, um, I, <laughs> we're both not sure which one of us, which one of us needs to come in. Um, probably too early to give an exact answer, like with many of these, but um, look, I think we can see that certification is kind of a, a key aspect of providing consumers, businesses with uh, assurance uh, that certain devices and products are meeting certain standards. So we can see, certainly see its value. Um, there is a, an aspect I know in the smart electric vehicle charging consultation around um, there's a proposal around um, uh, perhaps an assurance framework being put forward for smart charge points. So kind of, I suppose that hints at a kind of a certification regime, probably a bit early at this stage, but we can certainly see its value. Uh, I have um, uh, one question that's not on uh, cybersecurity, but I'm going to take it anyway. Uh, it's about, uh, this is for Nina. So uh, how do you see V2G and static battery storage fitting into the smart appliance model? 
Yeah, so the um, battery storage is, domestic batteries are, are well within the scope of this work uh, and they kind of operate like any other smart appliance, but probably with the more advanced capabilities of being able to provide flexibility maximum and minimums that are a little bit more advanced. So production of flexibility, uh, production of energy as well as consumption of energy, whereas most of those flexibility options will only be delaying or bringing forward consumption of energy. Um, vehicle, vehicle to grid isn't explicitly within the scope, but certainly, um, again, could be parts could be applicable. And I think the similar model uh, could be used. There's probably a couple of things needing to consider about that, because obviously you can't always guarantee the connection, but that might be handled by those profile updates. But it's certainly we, something we're aware is coming along. Um, and in those two year updates is something that can probably um, be added in and integrated if, if industry feel like that's a helpful point to be doing that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, James, Nina, uh, as I mentioned, there are so much happening in this space and you've shared some of the uh, key activities and you've encouraged people to uh, attend the webinars, maybe be in, uh, involved in the past work. So thanks again for that. As cybersecurity, it's great. There's a lot to be done uh, on the cybersecurity aspects. It's great to see that you're already commissioning studies. You're already thinking about these things. Um, there'll be not just different government bodies that need to work together, but also different players, both from, in, in the case of the EV ecosystem, from energy, from automotive. And uh, we do hope um, to, see, to see this is successfully uh, happening in the UK. Uh, before we close, do you have any last comments? Uh, I think I might just say thank you very much for for having having me, having us, Miriam, and everyone for listening in. Um, uh, pleased with your kind of summary of the description there, Miriam. We are trying to um, bring it all together as best we can, um, and a bit of a, a journey to go on. So we look. I think um, I'm sure Nino will echo this, but we kind of want to kind of make use of the industry expertise as much as we can going forward. We, there are these um, events coming up on the BSI standards work, um, uh, kind of reviews, I should say, I guess, uh, and government events as well. Uh, we really, really want your kind of uh, expertise. We want you to attend. Um, the door is open, I would say. So please talk to us, challenge us, and uh, yeah, hopefully we can make the system as secure as possible. Yeah, thanks very much. Definitely agree with James and all of that. And, and a big thank you to everyone who's engaged so much and given so much time already. Um, it's really great to have such a collaborative effort. Great. Okay, thanks again. Goodbye. Thanks. Thanks.